What's up, everybody? Reed Wallach with Fansided here to chat with Christian Leitner, Duke basketball legend, AT&T spokesman about all the cool things AT&T is doing for the NCAA tournament. Christian, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Reed. How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. So I'm going to keep it short here, but we have a few accolades I'd like to just like get everyone acquainted with if they don't remember, but two-time national champion with Duke, most points in NCAA tournament history, wooden award winner, and obviously you have arguably the greatest shot in college basketball history, the game winner against Kentucky in the 1992 Elite Eight. So I want to start there with the buzzer beater. Um, you know, we saw last weekend with San Diego State versus Creighton, they tried that full court pass with a second left. It didn't work out. Considering you are the crown jewel of this play, what goes through your head when you're watching end game scenarios and you see teams kind of throw the ball down the court? Are you a proponent of it? Like, what's your critique there watching these teams in late game situations? You know, I kind of like it because it takes me back to when I had to do it 30 years ago. But um, I think there's a chance that they may change their rule like the NBA where they can advance the ball to the front court, you know, mm -hmm. in the NBA. In the NBA, if you call a timeout, you don't have to take it out full court and make that full court pass anymore. You can move the ball ahead to the front court, and it just gives everyone a little bit easier of a chance to hit a game-winning shot. Um, so I don't know if the NCAA is going to do that or not. If they if they do make that rule change, then the Leitner play or the home run play, you know, will not happen anymore because it doesn't happen in the NBA because they can advance the ball. So we'll see what happens. But every time that situation arises, I feel the need to call my dad and say, dad, it's happening again. And they're going to, they're going to try the play. So it brings back fond memories and, and I smile on the inside a little bit and, you know, Creighton just didn't have enough time. They only had one 1.2 seconds, and that's not really enough. Um, and, you know, and then it didn't work out for them. The pass wasn't perfect, and and San Diego State did a great job contesting the catch. The Creighton player went up for the ball, but somebody from San Diego State, you know, jumped up, up in there like a, a – a football defensive back, a cornerback, and tip the pass away. So, so that's a good play. I think everyone, everyone learned over the last thirty years that you really have to contest the catch. If Kentucky would have fought me for the catch a little bit and not allowed the ball, you know, to get in my hands, then the shot would not have happened. So. <laughs> So it, it's good that at least the defensive players learn to contest the catch. Yeah, Coach Brian Dutcher, he must have shown, uh, you know, in practice uh, how to defend. And we should, went back to yours and be like, this is how you don't defend that play. This is how we stop the play. We can test it a little bit. So let's talk about the rest of the NCAA tournament, though, because I think March Madness is an understatement here. This has been a chaotic tournament. First time since the tournament expanded since 1979. No number one seeds made the Elite Eight. Uh, we have no one seeds, two seeds, or three seeds in the final four. As you're watching the tournament, Christian, anything stick out to you as to why this year is kind of different than all other years? Well, it's just the transfer portal has made a huge difference. And um, you don't get kids staying at a school for four years in a row like I did or like a lot of players back in the day did. Um in today's game, a lot of kids are jumping to the NBA, you know, after their freshman or sophomore year. And then if they're not happy with their playing time at the school they're at, they transfer. So it seems like every coach only has a year to develop his team and to, to develop his defensive philosophy and his offensive system. And it just all doesn't work in a year. And, and that is allowing and providing, you know, for there to be more parity in the game right now. John Calipari doesn't have two or three years to develop his players and, and to make them believe and to buy into the system. Bill Self at, at Kansas, you know, he doesn't have that, you know, kids staying there for years upon years. So, um, 
it's really shocking. And I'm surprised when the kids are doing so well on the court because they don't have that long to, de to develop, you know, the system, but you can see where a team like San Diego state who has some juniors and some seniors on their team, they have some fifth year players that are older that can get the defensive scheme under their belt and, and play defense the right way. That's a huge advantage. Um, Gonzaga is good every year because, mm. Because, you know, Mark Few, he somehow he talks his guys into staying for three or four years. And that makes a huge difference when you're playing against freshmen all the time. Yeah. So you would say as someone who was in the tournament four times, you were constantly the hunted as being, you know, Duke, being a, the Duke Blue Devils. How did you guys handle that pressure? Was that just like that veteran presence of, hey, one game elimination. We know that they're going to come and give us our best shot but so much experience together. Is that what made the difference and why you guys were able to win two national championships? We loved the pressure and we, we loved everything about it. And that's why you go to Duke. Um, you go to play college basketball because you want to play in big games, high pressure games. You want to go to Carolina and play in a, in a game where 20,000 people are trying to, you know, rip your head off. So, um, I miss that. <laughs> uh, I'm 53 now and I, I don't play really five on five anymore, but I do play some one-on-one -on -one against my son and against the kids that I coach. But one thing you miss so much is you miss playing in a gym that's packed with a bunch of teammates that you have a lot of confidence in. And it's that competitive spirit, that competitive game that you really, really miss. The only way I get it now is if I play pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's not quite the same, but I loved every second of it. I know every teammate I had at Duke, we loved those big competitive games. We loved entering the tournament where it's one and done. I mean, if you – if you don't play well for one night, you can lose to a 16 seed. So that type of cutthroat competitiveness was something that I just, I loved and I miss it. Absolutely. And let's talk about uh, Duke, uh, current day Duke though, because obviously some changes, Coach K not there anymore. First year for John Shire, second round exit for the Blue Devils. So a little bit below the standard, but I'd say a great first step for the Blue Devils moving forward. What did you see from Shire in his first year as the head coach and kind of where you see Duke, do you think that, listen, the gold standard's still there, that this is a team that wants to win national championships. Do you think Shire's the man that could take him there? I agree. A very good year for John Shire. If you go back and look at Coach K's first year at Duke, I don't know if he did that well. It, <laughs> um, it took Coach K four or five years to get his system implemented to get his defense down the way he wanted to play offense. And I heard that, you know, coach K's third year, they were, you know, the, the fans and the media were calling for Duke to fire him, but the athletic director hung in there with him. He saw something good in coach K and, and they re-signed him. And then coach K was able to get his system under, you know, under everyone's belt where the, the players bought into it. And then once the system was implemented, the rest is history. And coach mm -hmm. K had like an unbelievable 30 year run. So it takes a little while. That's why I think Shire did do a very good job. I agree with you. They had a good year, but it was still Jeremy Roach with like four freshmen surrounded by, you know, on the court. So, um, if you think of the Gonzagas and the San Diego State, they had some upperclassmen. So I'm hoping Duke, uh, some of their freshmen don't, you know, leave and jump to the NBA right away. You know, Filipowski might go, but I think everyone else could stay and, and have a sophomore year at Duke. And Duke will be really good and much better next year, especially because I think Shire is doing a good job as a coach. Um. When I watched Duke play in December and early January, they didn't quite look like a Duke team, but I'm proud to say, 
you know, by the end of February, Shire had them playing and looking like a Duke team. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see if Duke and, uh, you know, year two of John Shire, if they can have that one shining moment. Uh, of course, Christian, you are like the Kentucky play is the ultimate shining moment. And I know you're the star of AT&T's one shining moment commercial. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the partnership with AT&T and what they're doing to help consumers get the March Madness coverage they need? Well, it's so much fun doing stuff with AT&T. I got to meet Lily this year. <laughs> and I got to, I got to see Greg Oden and Adam Morrison and be on a beautiful beach in, in California. So it's just a great partnership. And AT&T involves me every year. And I love going to the Final Four. And I love to be in Bracket Town. And I love to be involved in March Madness. And um, I'll be there again this year working at Bracket Town. And um, it's something I treasure. And the thing I'm really looking forward to this year is I'm taking my son with me. I have a son who's 17 years old, so I'm taking him to the Final Four with me for the first time since he was maybe seven or eight years old where he didn't know or couldn't realize the, you know, how grand everything is there. So he's a basketball player now. He knows how much fun it is, and he's joining me going to Houston this year, so I'm really, really, really looking forward to it. Awesome. So now it's prediction time, though. We got Florida Atlantic San Diego State in the first game, UConn Miami in the second game on Saturday. Two winners play on Monday night for the national championship. So who's advancing to the title game, Christian, and then who's cutting down the nets late on Monday night? Well, I really wish Miami and UConn weren't facing each other in the <laughs> semifinal game because I love Miami because they're – in the ACC and my senior year, I think was the first year that Miami joined the ACC. So we got, we got to go down to Miami my senior year and play against them. So I'm pulling for the hurricanes, okay. but they are playing against UConn. And I love the way UConn plays. Danny Hurley's their coach. He visited Duke when he was in high school and Bobby was playing, you know, with me at Duke. So I know Danny very well, and I, I, want, I want him to do well and have success. But I think the Hurricanes are going to win the first game, and I think San Diego State's going to win the other semifinal, and I got the Hurricanes winning the national championship now. Wow. Okay. ACC keeping it in house. So Miami, San Diego State in the national championship, and Miami cutting down the nets. You heard it here first from Christian Leitner. Christian, big thanks for taking the time and all the work you and at t are doing to help everybody keep up with the big dance. I hope to talk soon and enjoy the games this weekend. Thanks a lot, Reed.